Okay. Are we good? My phone is on I got 58, but that should be plenty. Should be good enough. Can I go live? All right. You are now live. Welcome to the Ass Shine Show. We are now live once again today. I know no one's in the chat yet, but today we have Adrian Idso in the building. In the B-I-L-L-I-N. The billin. So let's see who all joins right away. Remember, guys, this is a Q&A. So you send me your questions and we answer whatever questions you have. No one else does this. We're the only ones that do this. And if you want to support, you could drop some badges to support. They're fucking cheap as shit, but if you want to drop some badges, I'll for sure answer your questions after that. Oh, your name is Adrian, too. Well, look at that. You spell it different than him, though. So um, you spell yours the basic way, A-D-R-I-A-N. Correct. And then she spells hers A-D-R-I-E-N-N-E. Yep. Mm -hmm. Is that's that the other girl. way? That's the girl way. That's the girl way. It yep. makes sense because she's a girl. Yo. Your shop crew is badass, including yourself. Thank you so much for including me in that. I would say they are badass, and I'm just, uh, you know, it's their world, and I'm just living in it. You know, that's how it goes. But, yeah, guys, remember, this is a Q&A, so drop whatever questions you have. If you want to support, drop some badges. They're really cheap. I do this for free, so... Anything to support is really fun to keep me engaged, keep me wanting to do this over and over again. Any questions that I answer on here that are good, we will clip them and put them on Instagram. So if you want to get on the gram, ask me some juicy ones. Is that what it is? Yeah, send a request. Fuck it. Get on the fucking live, bro. Uh, love, your, love you guys. I miss your blogs. You guys inspire me a lot. Uh, thank you, Stefano. We're actually going to have some new style of vlogs coming soon, mostly attributed to the traveling podcast, but then we'll also have shop vlogs that we've been doing. And yeah, all the content is going to get better and better as the time goes on. So I appreciate you following and a lot more coming in the future. What are some tips you can give for someone who wants to start tattooing? Well, first of all, Make sure you really want to commit to it because it is a huge commitment to get into tattooing and it is not an easy road. I think a lot of people see artists that are out here killing it and they're having fun and they're doing great and they're doing great work and they're getting paid good money and all this, but that doesn't happen overnight. So you got to be really ready for the commitment and the sacrifice it takes to become a good artist. A lot of people nowadays are going to start off in their house, right, which I don't. I'm not gonna tell you that I support that, even though I've done it myself, but there's just, sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do, right? But as soon as you can, you're gonna wanna get some guidance from someone that knows what they're doing so that you don't fuck people up or do something that's irreversible. And yeah, the commitment of it is just so tough, man. It's, you gotta be ready for that. And people have kids and lives and jobs and stuff. And for you to commit to tattooing, you gotta basically set all that aside for a better future. And yeah, I mean, get an apprenticeship if you can. Get around good artists, make some artist friends, get tattooed by artists and ask them some questions and stuff, but get little pieces of information where you can. Best thing you can do is get an apprenticeship and then just bang out the days in, days out, just practicing, getting better, learning the industry, learning the craft. Seems like everyone wants to be a fucking tattoo artist nowadays. It's making it really popular. I blame it on Adrian. There you know. Adrian is making this... Uh, you know, more popular. This guy has a good question. Right here. Hey, Reese Tattoos, thank you for the badge. Um, what's the question? Do you bury the needle when you're doing light shading or just skim the top? Ooh, let me see. Where is that at? Yeah, man. Get the mic closer it's, to your mouth. It's my first time. Sorry, guys. It's Adrian's first time. Uh, Reese Tattoos, thank you for the badge. Reese Tattoos asked, do you bury the needle when you're doing light shading or just skim the top? So when I'm doing darker shading, like those darker tones, just like black, I'm damn near wanting to saturate that like it's a color. That way when it heals, it's super solid. But once you start fading out those lighter grays, you gotta get a little more into the finessing, right? So yeah, skimming the top or just being able to have a feel for the needle and how it's hitting the skin so that you can get a perfect fade out. 
The funny thing is, is a lot of artists have like this very pretty hand motion, but even after that pretty hand motion, it's still not smooth. So you really got to get a feel for the needle hitting the skin and what pixels you're, because each dot that you're making with those needles is a pixel. And you're trying to fill up that area solid so that it looks like a tone, right? Even with the light gray, you're going to want to like make that saturated. But if you're trying to fade it out from a dark gray, you really got to use your finesse. So play around with different hand motions, different voltages and stuff like that for you to get a feel for it. And eventually it'll become second nature. Your art is dope as fuck. Thank you, Dylan. I appreciate you. Callie Styles, thank you for the badge. Let me make sure I didn't pass up any other questions because I am going fast. Hello from Arizona. When are you going to be on the PTD podcast? That's a good question. Um, soon. And we're definitely going to do some content together. Um, I think we really want PTD to keep doing their episodes, me to do my episodes, because my podcast is dropping soon. And we're going to surprise you guys with which episode that I end up coming on. And you guys better tune in because it's going to be a juicy episode. Dwayne Scott asks, how many tattoos do you have? I don't know, man. You lose track when you get blasted, you know? How many tattoos do you got, Adrian? Oh, man, I lost count after the third. After one. the third? Third big one. Oh, my God. He said because, after the third. Well, because well he could only count to three. Yeah, exactly. No, but I feel like once you start getting big ones, it's kind of hard to tell um, when it takes up so much space, especially because I was getting, like, not cohesive pieces. I would yeah. just get a big piece that my friend would draw and then it's like if you get a big piece does that count as one piece you yeah know? because if you like oh i got someone has 10 tattoos and i got two tattoos but my two tattoos cover more space than their yeah. 10 like which one who has more tattoos exactly yeah so that's kind of a hard question to answer um stefan cron said sat next to your table at gibson's in chicago but didn't want to bug you while you were eating that's crazy because that must have been a while ago and I must have been by myself. You could have 100% said hi. I love it when people come up to me and say what's up. But yeah, man, Chicago, dude. I ain't been there in a while. It must have been a few years ago at least. But yeah, man, if any of you see me out in public, you're not going to bug me by coming up to me and saying hi. If anything, I love talking to people and I love engaging in person. Because usually I only get to engage with you guys over Instagram and content and stuff. So if we're able to see each other in person, even if it's in passing, just a small interaction, I think we could both get a lot of good energy from it. So, yeah, I'm all for it, man. Say what's up next time you see me. All right. Blake Green asks, thoughts on paying for an apprenticeship? What do you think is a reasonable price range? So I didn't pay for my apprenticeship. I did get offered an apprenticeship where they were gonna charge me $10,000. And at the time it seemed like a shit ton of money because I was poor at the time. So it was just out of the question. So I turned that one down and found one that didn't charge me. But I, I'm not against people charging for apprenticeships because I understand how much of a commitment it is for the artist to take someone on. I would say you know, that $10,000 one, I mean, that's kind of reasonable. But at the end of the day, the commitment is way beyond the money. So regardless whether they're charging you or not, it's a lot of fucking commitment from both of you guys, right? And the artist basically has to put everything else aside to teach you everything they know that they've ever learned. And that's a very sacred thing. So I think if you're really going to give someone an apprenticeship, you have to be connected to them in some way and feel like you can get along with them and make sure that they're your protege and all that shit and it feels good on a day in, day out. Cause this is gonna be a long-term engagement. It's like getting into a relationship, you know? So I don't know. I don't really know a price range for that because I wouldn't charge someone for an apprenticeship. But on the other hand, I'm not against it either. If that gets loud, you could turn it down again still. I don't know if it's fine. Okay, cool. Um, all right, let's make sure I did not. Yeah, Reese, you were, you were first. You were first with the shit. Uh, let me make sure I'm not passing up any. Okay, I didn't pass anybody up. Okay, I'm going to go back to the refreshed. Adrian, view, go live with Adrian. Yeah, no problem, bro. No problem. Um, there's a, some questions that get repeated over and over in these Q and A's and part of me just wants to, uh, oh, we might not be able to do this, bro. Okay. Yep. 
Can you leave the chat, please? Yeah. I think that happened to us last time when me and Jessa did it, and there was like this the ringing sound or yeah. whatever. Yeah, that's not that's not gonna work. All right, give me some questions, guys. Give me some juicy ones. Let's see. How to go about when tattooing on scars or stretch marks? How much do you pull the skin when having stretch marks? So tattooing over stretch marks is always going to be difficult because they swell quickly. And once they swell, it's harder and harder to go over them. But if I had to say anything, I would be like, be intentional about how that needle is hitting. Go a little bit slower and make sure that those needles are hitting evenly over that uneven skin. And just do as much as you can without damaging the skin. Try to saturate over the stretch marks as much as you can. And once you feel like you've done a sufficient job, just move on. And if you have to touch it up, you could touch it up later. But like, you don't wanna overwork that area. You don't wanna get it so swollen that it's not gonna take any ink at all. It's kind of a big deal because stretch marks will swell so much and it's, it's kind of tough. It's just um, something you've got to deal with as a tattoo artist, especially for people that have lost a lot of weight or gained a lot of weight. Scars is a little different. You need to gauge how fresh the scar is, how deep it is, what, how the keloid is, like how, how much does it stick out from the skin and all of that stuff. So you got to get, become good at gauging if you can go over a scar or not. Most scars that are healed for a year or more are good but you still wanna be careful going over it because it's damaged skin and it's gonna take the ink differently and it's gonna take the needle damage differently. So just be very careful. Scars and stretch marks are definitely different. Stretch marks, okay, it's fine, it just swells. Scars, you gotta be really intentional about how you hit it. Uh, Cutthroat Inc. asks, what's the best tips you have on hand positions and client positioning? Well, you need to take the time to play around with different positions. I know a lot of people will put their client in a position that makes the artist uncomfortable, but the client is comfortable, but it makes the job way harder on you. So I would say take the time to find the perfect position for, your, for yourself, especially if you're like left-handed, right-handed. Like how do you want them to sit when you're tattooing their thigh? Or like what angle do you want to come at it with? You don't want to constantly be bent over, standing up, trying to tattoo someone's chest. So how can you get them to lay so that you can access their chest while they're laying down and you're sitting down? So just take the time to try out different things. And then especially when you're going for different shades or different lining, especially lining, you wanna make sure your hand position is in a comfortable spot before you go and sink the needle in and start pulling. Cause a lot of times people will get in a rush and then they just start like just doing whatever when they're tattooing and they'll go run a line and they're not thinking about their hand position. So right when you start sinking that line in and you're moving, you start like shaking or you move or something like that or you have to pick the needle up because you didn't intentionally place your hand in a good position, right? So I would say, yeah, just be super conscious about your hand position before you go into the skin. Every mark you make is permanent. So just think about that like that, right? Every time you sink that needle into the skin, you wanna make sure you're comfortable and it's about to go in the right depth and it's gonna go in evenly. And eventually it'll become second nature to where you don't have to think about it that much. But yeah, man, when you're learning, you gotta get that muscle memory down. Let me adjust my mic. All right. Remember, guys, these are going to be clipped for Instagram. And if you want to support, go ahead and drop a badge. A couple of you guys already dropped some badges, and I really appreciate it. Let's get some more in here. A good question by Bad, Bad Vibes Tattoos. Um, let's see. Let me find it. Oh, we got a bunch of badges in here. For mm -hmm. You're probably on the more recent, or I can't find that one. Where is it? You can read it off mine right here. Oh, you bought a badge. Nice. Bad Vibes, thank you for the badges. He said, hey, bro, how would you go about wanting to learn from artists as an established artist? Would it be worth being in a shop or guest, guesting to learn from more people? Okay, good question. So yeah, a lot of established artists will get into this mode where they're good enough to just be in their own shop and just keep going and working and stuff. But then you get this like feeling 
Like, am I done learning? No, you're not done learning, right? So you're like, man, I wish I could become the person that is being taught again. And it's hard to seek those people out because you're like, oh, I want to learn from that person, but I'm not an apprentice, I'm not this, I'm not that. I would say getting tattooed by some of your favorite artists is the easiest way to get in with them without asking too much favor of them. Because if you're just like, hey, can I come learn from you? They might let you come sit in on a session, but if you don't want it to be more of a favor, you could also pay them to get tattooed. And you can learn a lot from someone by getting tattooed by them. And then they're more open to answering any question that you have no matter what. And I'm sure most established artists, if you were getting, if, if you were getting tattooed by them, they'd be so open to answering questions. I know I would, but I'm a little different, right? But it's better than asking for a favor from them. Like, hey, bro, like, can I just, you know, impede on your, your bubble and just show up? And I'm sure some people would do that. I know I'm kind of like that, but a lot of other artists might just ignore you. So get tattooed by them, man. Ask them some questions. See their process. Because sometimes even if you're already really good, seeing another established artist process might give you a different perspective on how you could adjust yours. I know I want to do that. I even want to do that, guys. Like, I really want to go to some of my favorite artists. Even if their work isn't, like, exactly the way I want my work, there's definitely something about, especially artists that do really large-scale work, how are they prepping that large scale work? How are they prepping a extra large back piece that includes the butt cheeks? Like how are they stenciling that? How are they taping it together? What printer do they use? What stencil printer do they use? All of these different notes and tricks that you could take from someone that has that shit down, right? Cause I got my own tricks, I got my own tips, but there's plenty of them out there and you gotta stay ready to learn. Cause I know I am. Uh, Tamir, thank you for the badge, asked, have you had clients you turned off? Turned off. I think you mean like turned away? Like did I turn some clients away maybe? And if you're, if you're saying that, then I would say, yeah, of course. I, I turn away clients all the time, but mostly because when they email, their criteria doesn't fit my criteria. We have a criteria of a type of work we want to do and like, all of that type of stuff. And if it doesn't align, then sometimes I won't take it. Or if the idea is just like not in reality, it's just something that's like, ah, I don't, I'm not, I'm not really feeling that. Or sometimes people will just email for a color tattoo and we just straight up don't do color, right? So like take a look at my work on my Instagram. You know, you look at it and you're like, oh, I love your work. Can I get a color piece from you? It just doesn't make any sense. So those guys will get turned away and sometimes it just doesn't line up. You know, maybe the price range is out of their price range. Maybe our ideas just don't line up. I really just want to focus on stuff that I'm really excited about. Every time I tattoo, I want to be excited about it. So those are the clients I'm going to take. And of course, some of them are going to get turned away. But for the most part, I end up having amazing clients and everyone is happy. Moving on, moving on. If you guys want to drop a badge, I see you guys dropping them. I really appreciate it. You guys are killing it with the badges right now. Ooh, here's a good one. Um, Ip Loves Art, I think that's the name. LP. LP Loves Art. Thank you for the badges. Asks, does it offend you when artists leave your shop after being with you for a while? This is a good question because um, this has happened to me a couple times. Obviously, it happens to every shop owner. You're going to run into that problem eventually. And I wouldn't even call it a problem. I would say it's mostly about how they leave. You know, you want to go about it the right way. You want to give them a heads up. You want to make sure everything's cool. And for me, if an artist gave me a heads up and they were just like, hey, man, you know, I just want a different environment. I just want to, you know, evolve and just, and just feel some different stuff, you know. You don't even got to justify it to me. As long as you're doing it the right way and you're giving me a heads up and you're giving me that respect, I'd be totally fine with whatever an artist wants to do. One pet peeve is kind of like if I just started, you just started with us within a year or something like that, and I'm like pouring into you and I'm teaching you every, everything I know every day, putting a lot of energy into you. And as soon as you think that you're good, you just want to dip um, because now you, you can. You're making more money, you, you have more skill, and you feel like you could just go off on your own. That's kind of like, it's kind of shady only because like, I committed to teaching you, not for you to just dip as soon as you felt like you were good enough. I did that to invest in you in the long term. 
And I, I, I expect some of those people to stay with me at least long enough for us to just do something together, you know? If I brought you from zero to level 10, and you could have gone to level 50, but you left at level nine, it's just like, it's just a missed opportunity. But overall, if, you know, everything is respectful, 100% I'm down for an artist to leave. It's totally fine. It's the nature of the game. You cycle people in, you make good friends, you teach them, you, you give value, and then they leave, and then you get more people, and you do the same thing over again. And if you're not ready for that cycle, then you shouldn't be a shop owner because there's a lot of emotions and a lot of things that go into it. So just think about that if you ever want to be a shop owner. There's a lot of uh, people you're going to have to deal with, a lot of emotions and a lot of different dreams and goals. And you've got to be able to just stay strong like a brick wall through it all, you know? Good question. Uh, moving on, moving on. Hello, I am a big fan of your tattoo work. Thank you, The Precious. Uh, Masibo one asks, how much time do you spend on a decent piece on average? How many hours? Uh, I mean, a basic day is anywhere from eight to 10, sometimes more. I mean, we only do full day sessions. So those full day sessions, they usually involve at least eight hours. And then they could definitely go above that depending on the piece. But I don't really mind. I'm committed to the client on that day if they pay a day rate. So whether it takes 12 hours or eight hours, I'm all for it. So, yeah, that's usually what a full session is. Sorry for the uh, sound in the background. We're getting that taken care of right now. The guys are watching a movie while they're tattooing, and we're just doing this because that's what we're here to do. Uh, moving on, moving on. Harley Trent, are you taking questions? Yes, please shoot your questions. Make them some good ones. We've answered a lot of uh, basic questions on the live Q&As, and I'm hoping some of you can go in your bag and see if there's any questions that you really want to know, you know? Let's get to the juicy ones. She just asked this one right after. Oh, Harley did? Yep. Okay, I'll look for her right now. Let me... Uh, no problem, bad vibes, appreciate you. Uh, Harley Trent asked, I have a tattoo that I want to get finished. It was started about six years ago, and then it never got finished. Who would you recommend and would your shop be willing to do it black and gray? So Harley, thank you for asking a question. I do not think anybody in the shop would be interested in finishing a tattoo that was started by another artist. There are people that do that, but here we like to work on original pieces that are fully our own. Because if we were gonna take on a client and put that time into you and all of that stuff, we would wanna commit to that piece and have it to be something we could put our name on, right? And if we have to do someone else's piece, they might have started it a way that we wouldn't have done it. So we always have to put up with the idea that like, fuck, this is not going to be as good. And it's not the way I would do it and all this shit. So I don't really touch other people's work. I don't think anybody else in the shop does either. If you could, I would get it fixed by the guy that started it. But if you can't, just go to someone who is okay with it. Yeah, I mean, it's tough to get artists to touch other artists' work, and I'm, I'm sure you could understand why. Charlie Tats. Is that uh, newer? It's right under hers. How is it? How come I can't see that one? What the fuck? Let me see. Nope. Okay, um, Chael Tats or whatever. Sorry, I, I don't know how to say your name. Business question. Do you payroll for your artist or yourself through ADP or Gusto, et cetera? So payroll is usually for W-2 employees, right? And our, our artists are not W-2 employees. There are 1099 independent contractors in 99% of tattoo shops. If you W-2'd them, it would cost a lot of money in taxes. And they're technically independent contractors because they have their own skill, their own equipment, and they could take that and work wherever they want. So I do not payroll 
through any of them. I do have a manager that I W-2 and you know we run everything through QuickBooks and her payment is on a direct deposit and all of that so it's set up automatically. But we don't payroll our artists, they are definitely 1099 independent contractors. But I will say we do pay them in a check at the end of every week. We used to give them cash every day but some artists don't like getting cash every day because it's like makes them more irresponsible with their money, right? But not only that, they would rather have a chunk of money at the end of the week rather than piecing out the money day by day. And it's easier to keep track of for financial reasons for the business because we're paying out cash every day. That's, that means that cash wasn't ran through the bank first and we don't have that shown on the bank statements and we won't have that paper trail. And if you're a business and you really want to do good business, you're going to want to track all your money you make, keep a paper trail, don't worry about like flying under the radar of taxes and stuff. You're better off learning how to play the tax game the right way. That way you could really win in business. Uh, Tamir said, yo, we can't hear you. Is that, is that real? Can you hear me? I can hear you. If you guys can't hear me, tell me. I, I feel like you can, though. Hold on, let me adjust my mic. All right, moving on, moving on. Give me some good ones. guap for Inc. asked, what are the best needles you prefer using and what's the volts you usually prefer when it comes to light shading? So the best needles I use, I am a Quadrant needle sponsored artist. I swear by Quadrants, I love them. I love how they feel. I love the framing around the cartridge and everything and how they're grouped together. And what's the volts you usually prefer when it comes to light shading? I usually keep the same volts for everything I do. So it's always gonna be around seven to 7.5. And I usually keep it around 7.5, but if I get in an area that it feels like it's hitting a little hard or it's chewing it up real quick, then I'll, I'll lower the voltage. I usually never go below seven, and I don't even really think about the voltage that much. And if I do, it's usually gonna be through feeling. Like if I feel like it's just hitting too hard or it's hitting too fast, then I'll adjust it by a couple points. But I'm never like, oh, I need to be at 7.5. I need to be at 7.7. .7. I need to be. I just do it by feeling at this point. But it'll always stay in the range of 7 to 7.5 volts. Are we bringing a? We got young Eric Satchmo in the billin, B-I-L-L-I-N, joining the show. There he is. He got a Peaks and Valley shirt on. He does not work here, but he looks like he does. And he looks like he should. Little does he know I was going to tell him to shut his shop down and bring everybody over. I'm saying, though, you got to combine two worlds together. It'd just, be uh, your nine artists or ten artists, and then my nine artists or ten artists. Oh, bro, we can make it work, bro. I had some stations. We'll get cracking, bro. So you are not on my live stream, kind of, because I am kind of have this on me, right? But you definitely are on that camera right there. Yes, sir. Yeah, so we are in this bitch. So... I wanted to bring Eric on here because he is guest spotting right now. He's already been here for a day, and he's actually tattooing right now. And he wanted to ask some questions, so I told him to save it for the Q&A, right? Got some good, some good he questions. He said he got some good ones. Some good ones. Some ones that you haven't even uh, heard yet, so. Good. Hold on one sec. Why don't you get this a little closer a little to your closer. face? There you go. There we go. Uh, let's start right out the bat. Um, where do you see the future of tattoo conventions? Ooh -wee. Okay, we talked about this a little bit, right? Yes, we did. Yes, so you kind of know some of this, right? But I'm going to tell everybody watching the, the clip right now. Where do I see tattoo conventions going in the future? So right now, tattoo conventions are ran by OG artists mostly. Like most of the people putting on these conventions have been in the game for 20 years plus, and they've been doing this convention, and they're basically grandfathered into the cycle of conventions that happen year round. The problem is, is it's just that, you know, it never goes beyond that. And I think the future of it, and what we need to focus on as young artists doing, you know, the new stuff and trying to innovate is we gotta get tattooing more integrated with pop culture. And again, this is what we've already talked about, but something along the lines of a tattoo convention mixed with a complex con or something that involves more hype beast stuff or artists or different types of artists, musical artists, singers, and stuff like that. And if we're able to integrate those two, it'll make it a much 
bigger range of audience and the type of, event, of events we could have is huge. Yeah. And the potential is pretty high too. Uh, like there's a lot of times where we're doing these shows and it's the same stuff over and over again. Right. It's the same side uh, entertainment and it'd be cool to spice it up a little bit. And you know, when we get a chance to do that, I think that's going to like take off in a, a very high way. You right. Know? No, hundred uh, percent. Like, I don't know. There's only villain arts, and then you got the Golden State. Right. And then you got um, you got uh, Empire State. It's all the same thing though. Yeah. So, I think if somebody new like you steps in and gives a whole new tattoo experience for a convention, I think that'd be pretty good. Yeah, I think so. And you go to a lot of conventions. What is mostly the type of entertainment that you see? Because they always have these times where they're like, oh, welcoming to the stage, and then they have some sort of act that comes up. It's usually like the, the people on the hooks. Yep. Uh, like hanging from the ceiling. Mm -hmm. I try not to watch it, it's pretty crazy. Um, got little side skits too. Sword swallowing, I yeah, see. Yeah, sword swallowing. It's like stuff that people have been doing for years and they perfected that, that craft. So it's cool for the audience, you know, that's there. They got the kids there, like it's just something different for them. But for us, it's the same thing every show. So it would be cool to see uh, something different. I think, too, what sucks about that is um, that is a kind of a stigma that sticks, sticks with tattooing. It's like the old carnival days, like you're a carny. <laughs> yeah. So, like, why would they put these acts that are like, because back in the day, if you were heavily tattooed, you would be at, like, at a carnival as like a freak show. Yeah. You know, you would be a part of that group. But now it's like we want to get away from that, but they're still coupling us with these crazy like body mod crazy stuff and that'll always be a part of the culture but there's way more to be had if we're going to integrate it back into pop culture like i said like there's not enough music there's not enough there's a better difference. vibe that could be created 100 for sure yeah. yeah and i'd say that most of the people that go to these conventions literally i bet most of these people don't give a fuck about <laughs> sword swallowing Right. You know, I, I respect the sword swallowing, right? You could even keep that, but at least let's add some acts in there that are more aligned with the culture or like the new people or, and it just gets some new kind of flavor in there. Like there's never concerts, there's never, you know, um, live painting, there's never, none of that stuff. And I well, feel you were like, saying yesterday, like we can throw like somebody like a Jack Harlow. Dude, you know, if we can integrate with someone who is actually popular nowadays in the music industry and then throw that into a tattoo convention, that would bring so much audience. And I know that takes a lot of money, but everything takes a lot of planning and logistics. But if we were gonna do it, we would wanna do it right. And I think it's gonna take someone to very intentionally invest a lot of time and energy into testing out a new way of doing conventions. Well, there's also a lot of things you got to do too. So you got liabilities, you have insurance, you got a oh, venue, you crazy. got security. Um, health department. Health department, uh, codes. Yeah. and. Once you get past there, then you gotta invite the big name artists. And then you gotta front them because you want them to be there. Right. Because they're gonna attract the other artists. Right. And you gotta let them know years ahead of time because these guys are booked out for a long time. They got other conventions planned. So if you're doing a, if you're doing a new convention and you want some of these big name artists to be at your convention, you have to let them know at least a year and a half ahead of time. And you're gonna have to pay them. You're gonna have to comp their booth, comp their flights and all that stuff. So, so some people would tell me like, why don't you put on a convention? Because that would be dope if you know how to do it. And I'm like, it's way more than you think. Yeah, you just don't have enough time. Yeah, it's, it's tough. You gotta really commit all of you to doing it. And it takes a village, it's gonna take a team. I do think someone's gonna do it one day. Maybe we'll be involved in it. Maybe it's a team of people that does it, not just one person. Maybe me and you team up with somebody. Maybe, hey man, hey man, you manifest it, it might just happen, right? But I do think a team would be even better because you share the responsibility and then you share a vision and then maybe something cool comes of it. But yeah, that convention talk is a, is a huge subject and I think that uh, I think that in the future, if we're going to be more integrated into pop culture, it's going to start with the conventions. And then from there on out, it's going to go from like these different tattoo influencers just reaching broader audiences and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah, for sure. Let's transition. I got another one for you. Hold on one sec. Is the audio good? Because it's OK, because it sounds a little echoey and stuff. Yeah, I can hear a little echo, too. I, I, yeah, I can hear that, too. OK, it just sounded a little it just sounded a little different than it did like 10 minutes ago. I mean, if it's fine and you're then it's fine. OK. All right, go ahead. Uh, let's transition. Let's transition. I got a lot of questions for you, my man. Um, when, you, uh, when you look at your past self, like on your YouTube page, what growth do you see? 
Wow. See, this is the kind of questions you guys need to be asking me, man. Jesus Christ. We want to know the good stuff. This is crazy, bro, because, like, I haven't really watched a lot of my old content. I don't just, like, sit there and watch my old content a lot, right? Yeah, yeah. But every once in a while, I'll get kind of curious. You got to reminisce a little bit. No, I do. I do. Because <laughs> sometimes you got to do that to see how far you came, right? So I look yeah. at old YouTube blogs and stuff like that from even two years ago, three years ago, five years ago. And even from the ones that are, like, not that long ago, a year or two ago. I see so much. Still a lot of growth. It's a lot of growth, even just, not even in just tattooing, but just in life in general. And I think about where I was at in that time, and I could point out so many things that I've learned since then. And I'm in this constant, as I'm sure you are, and, and a lot of people are, but I'm in this constant state of like learning and growth, right? Yeah. Not just tattooing and everything, characteristics about yourself that you want to better. And you just want to become a better person, a stronger person, and someone that doesn't get moved so easily by opinions or life or anything like that right yeah so it's crazy because it happens so gradual that you might not even notice it that much as it's happening yeah not in the moment i usually notice it when i'm going through like my instagram stories right kind of like backtracking and then i realize like like man i used to do a tattoo like this and then now i do it like this yeah even like from last week i did a tattoo like this and then you know you gave me your drop system and now this tattoo i'm doing right now is coming out pretty fire but it is. it's a whole new different setup. So I'm, I'm still trying to get used to it, but it's a whole different look of my work. Well, look, you got to take chances to make advances. You know, you got to try new things and then new things will happen. And um, you're right. You know what's crazy is there's going to be a whole generation of people that have digital video and photos from the time they're born to the time <laughs> they're 80 years old, right? Yeah. So now imagine when we're 80 years old and we get to look back on these photos and videos that are 4K HD videos of when you were 20 years old. Right. Well, bro, that's what? <laughs> that's insane. Yeah. Like home videos is one thing with the tapes and all that, but like if you had 4K digital video of your best memories, and the problem with memories are when you get older, memory fades. Yeah, but I mean, memory fades, but your YouTube videos are going to last forever. That's what I'm saying. And, you know, as long as YouTube doesn't go out of business, I don't yeah. think it will. Google, Keep our fingers Google, crossed. <laughs> Google's one of the biggest companies in the world, and they have the most reach, and they have the most searches, and all that stuff. Google is huge, so I don't think YouTube. I think YouTube is going to get even bigger. It's going to replace television almost fully, right? There'll always be maybe a little spot for television, but people right. are going to consume YouTube more than they consume anything else. And podcasts for sure. Yeah, but all of that. Yeah, podcasts for sure. But even like video podcasts on YouTube and all that stuff, that's all going to play a part into it. But yeah, man, uh, I definitely look back at those old vlogs and I'm like, damn, I can't believe. I mean, look how I look. I'm like, I look different. I sound different. I, t I speak different. So I'm, I'm, I'm grabbing like a lot of your content in a short span because like I, I just got to know you a little bit. Right. So I had to like backtrack on the YouTube videos and I seen the growth. Uh, I'm probably only seen like, uh, say like 40 videos. And I went just 40 videos, just no, 40. No big deal. I feel like you got like over 100. You have to, right? Yeah, 100 and I don't know, 120 maybe. Yeah, and that's not even counting like the little snippets in between, but like all the way back to where it was just Shine Studio, even before that. So I don't even know like the before, before uh, story of yourself, you know. But based off what I've seen, I've seen, I've seen your growth maybe like at least four different stages within yeah. that time period, right? And it's cool to see. And then now I'm like here, and you're like right here. And we're like, we're cool. So, Isn't that funny? Yeah, it's crazy. It's yeah. like full circle moments. Yeah, I mean, full circle moments. That's how you know you manifested something to happen, right? And um, yeah, I mean, it's kind of crazy. It's kind of cool being a, I guess you could call it a YouTuber, or just someone that does content. Because you're right, four different stages. Like, I used to work at a different shop, and then I got my own shop, and then I upgraded shops. And then I, and I've been doing content since, you know, three shops ago, four shops ago, it's right? It's crazy. Which is wild because I never, I haven't really shared the most personal stuff on YouTube, but definitely as those videos are happening, there's crazy shit happening yeah. that change your life forever, that are just huge things. And if you just power through and just keep doing content, you always have those memories and, and that documented of those times that basically made you who you are today. You know, it's, it's a wild thing to have. Is there a lot of things you feel like you missed? Missed as in... You just didn't get it on video and you, oh, you think you should have? I feel like people feel 
mostly like that, you know, if you're, especially if you're into doing content a lot, you're always going to wish that this or that was captured. Yeah. And then you want it to happen in a, in a, a, in a natural, yeah, yeah, in a natural way. You don't want to have to reset up a situation so that you can capture it on video. It's going to feel, it's going to feel like forced, forced, you yeah. know, it's not going to feel natural. The it's, best thing you could do is just be open to the shit being, you know, the camera being on and you sharing. And a lot of people are like hesitant about sharing certain shit and they just want to be very robotic with what they're saying as the camera's rolling. But I feel like the more transparent you get, although it might be uncomfortable in the moment, is the things that people get the most value out of. And then those are the things that really set you apart from other YouTubers. Facts. Facts. I got, uh, we're going to transition a little bit. All right. He's leading the pod. <laughs> I'm asking you the questions. Uh, let's see. Scroll through. Let's scroll through. How do you think tattoo shops should handle walk-ins? Okay. So I've spoken on this before, and we've talked about this a little bit. I feel like I like the answer you gave me yesterday a, lot, a little bit better. Right. Yeah, I think so, too. This is a two-part, by the way. Okay. Two-part. That's fine. So how do I think tattoo shops should handle walk-ins? Well... Here's the thing, it's also situational because some shops really need the walk-ins and stuff, right? But then other shops have a couple people that are booked out or getting booked out and then others can't get booked out so they try to take walk-ins and all this stuff. So their systems are crossing and they're different from each other, right? Yeah. Which kind of sucks because if you're running a shop, you would want the system to be applied to everybody, but not everyone could get booked out. So for walk-ins, the way I would do it if we still took walk-ins is I wouldn't just let someone walk in, say, hey, I want this, and then they sit down, and then they, and then they just tell you, hey, right now, I want this, and do this, and do that, right? Because anybody that walks into the shop ends up being your boss. But if you want to maintain control over it, especially if you have artists in the shop that take appointments only, and you want to keep a similar vibe between the system, you could do same-day appointments, you could do next-day appointments, if someone comes in at nine o'clock and says, hey, I want to get a tattoo today. And it's like, okay, we actually have an artist available. Why don't we uh, give you a time and then you can come back and we'll be already set up and designed for you. So you set that appointment for maybe 3 p.m. Mm -hmm. and, and then they come back and then the artist is ready. They, had, they got time to mentally prepare and then they could start booking out. And then if someone, if someone else comes in while that person is getting tattooed, you could just book them for tomorrow at 10 a.m. And then all of a sudden, that person has two days booked. Yeah. So then that's how people are going to get booked out based on walk-ins is, I know you could take it right in that moment, but it's almost better to start building out your calendar more than just shove everybody in an in hour window, you know? And get treated any kind of way. Yeah, and then just yeah. take shit from anybody because they're in control at that point. You want to maintain control of your system and respect your system so that they'll respect it. Now, if somebody, if an artist is hourly... How do you, uh, how do you, what's your advice for them to get them to the point where they are ready to do half days and full days? Well, we talked about this as well, but I think instead of just going straight up hourly, it's better to do half day, full days. And what you could do is, let's say you don't know how long a tattoo is going to take. Maybe it's going to take two, maybe it's going to take three and a half. You don't know. You would charge them for a half day. And then at the end of the day, if it didn't end up taking the full amount of time, you can refund your client the money. And the, the mentality behind that is your client would much rather be refunded money rather than you ask them for more money. Because if it ends up taking like a full half day and you only charge them for two hours, now you're like, hey, that took two extra hours. I'm going to need an extra fucking, I don't know, $250 from yeah. you. They're going to be like, God damn it. Like, I got to come out of pocket more than I already have. Mm -hmm. So, and I like this better because you're able to take the payment in the beginning of the day before the session so that the money thing is out of the way. Because once you wait till after, there's always that little weird moment after you're done with your tattoo that you're like, oh, now I got to have that conversation with them. Where it's like, oh, okay, now I'll take payment. It's an awkward conversation. And the tattoo's done already. So yeah. they, it has to happen, right? And there's some things that clients will do, like weird shit that'll like haggle the price. And it's like, oh, well, this, oh, well, that. We took three breaks. This shouldn't cost this much. Exactly. And it's like, if you take a half day or a full day up front and then you're able to refund them, you could be like, hey, guess what? Merry Christmas. <laughs> Here's $400 back because it didn't, it took two hours less than we thought it was going to take. I think that's a better route to go for people. And then it aligns you with where you really want to be, which is only doing full day sessions. That way you could 
Book out your calendar, know what you're going to do every day, know how much money you're going to make, and you can rely on that money as if it was a career and not just a hustle. This one's for you. I thought these were all for me. Nah, that was like for a shop. Okay. This one's for you, though, because uh, like you do really complex, well-thought-out, uh, big tattoos every day. Well, not every day, but, you know, you're every posting day. them on a regular. Yeah, 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 yeah. So... Do you ever feel like you run out of creativity or hit like a mental block? That's a good question. Do I run out of creativity or go through a mental block when it comes to... Because you're trying not to repeat yourself at the same time, too. That's the hardest part, dude. And even at this level, a lot of the clients, they have similar ideas. So they'll come at you with the same ideas as the last client. Sometimes back to back. Like I'll have a client and then the next client wants a very similar thing. Yeah. Or they'll show you a picture of a tattoo you did and they want, they're like, oh, I want something just like this. But your job as an artist, especially at this level, is you have to make original art every single time. Not just once a week, not just one, twice a month or whatever. Every tattoo you do, you want to put your spice on it to make it original. And the only way that I've been able to do that is, let's say someone comes to me with a, a very common theme. You know, I want a lion and a Jesus and a clock, dove and, a clock and a dove and a rose. <laughs> So sometimes what I'll do is I'll go look at all the pieces online that have been done with those things, and I'll start eliminating different compositions and and different elements. Like I'm like, all right, that's been done, that's been done, that's been done, that's been done, and I, it's kind of a process of elimination. And what what I have left is different compositions that I've never seen before. Yeah. So I'm starting to take note mentally, like, okay, I'm not gonna put just the line on the upper arm only, and then I got the clock right below. I'm gonna do a different composition. Now maybe the clock is blended into the lion's eye and then I got a piece of filigree framing the bottom and then you wanted a Jesus, but I ended up doing a Jesus silhouette of him walking out of uh, the cave. The Jesus piece one is the one that influenced that question. Oh, really? Yeah, I'm looking at it right now. I actually looked at it last night. I was like, okay, people ask you for a Jesus piece all the time. Right. And you can do the standard Jesus piece that you see on, uh, on Pinterest. Right. And then you'll just look like every other tattoo. 100%. But then you go in here and you throw like the Jesus walking out the tunnel and then the filigree and the dove. Right. And then the placement is perfect too. Uh, I feel like that's the most important part. Your placement is like pretty crazy. Even the the tattoo I seen you do the other day, uh, yesterday. Yeah. And like you're like mid tattoo and then you're like, I mean, let's throw this right here, like right on the top of the bicep, but it just flowed really great. Mm -hmm. And then I came back in and it was, it was amazing. Well, thank you. And that's why I preach so much that composition is a huge part of this designing game because I could probably use the same reference. Not that I would, but I could use the same references as someone else and get a different look just based on how you compose it. Right. Yeah. That Jesus walking out of the cave. I put that there because I needed something to break up all of that black. And when I was looking at the design overall, there was a bunch of dead space and I was looking at it. I was like, there's no way I'm just going to black that spot out because it's just it feels like something can go there. Now, at the time, I didn't know what I was going to put there, but I knew it had to be something that would be able to come out of the darkness and make sense. Like, I just like wasted space, just shading and stuff like no, that. Oh, yeah, yeah, because, I mean, you could do that in some areas to make it breathable, but at the same time, you could tell if you develop an eye for this type of shit that there is room for something to go there. And it's all about developing your eye for that type of stuff, right? And to that point of references, if... I can find references that I don't see a lot of people using. That's a big thing, too. Like and these I, AI images. Yeah, the AI changed the game, bro. AI has changed the game. You can get references that are original that no one else in the world has. And even on top of that, you know, I can take something that people don't see as a good reference, and then I'm like, you know what? If I clean this up, this could be a totally different look than what people are used to seeing. And there's a lot of Jesus faces, a lot of lines I will never use because I've seen it done too many times. Yeah. On purpose, I will not use those ones. I'll even use one that looks blurry, but I like the positioning <laughs> of the head. Switch it up a little bit. Yeah, you know, maybe you could run it through uh, Remini, Remini or Remini, whatever. Yeah. And then maybe you could draw over it and try to sharpen some things up, but then you get a totally different look than most people get. And especially in this black and gray world, man, to stand out, you got to have really good composition and then just really be intentional about how you pick your references and how you contrast stuff you know well your, your style really stands out and everybody in the shop does it at a really high level so i appreciate that coming from another black and gray artist we're trying to always like grasp a new concept and this concept of uh, more negative skin is better 
Mm -hmm. That part's hard. I would ask you, how long did it take for you to grasp that concept comfortably? Yeah. Well, I, I guess it helps when I watch someone that I'm in the shop with doing it. Because when you learn from example, and I'm sure you're like a lot of people, you have to see it be done. If you see it be done in person, you could just pick it up right away. I have to away. see it like in my face because then I know it can be done. Yeah. So I have no reason to like not try it. Right. And sometimes I've even picked up machines for someone mid tattoo to show them what they can get away with. And once they see me do it with their machine in that moment on their piece and it works, then they're like, oh, that's fire. That's fire <laughs> because you're not using just like a magic, bro. Like there's nothing that I'm doing that is so different from what you're doing that you can't do it. Same machine. Same machine. That's why we all do the same machine, same inks. Because if I'm getting an effect that you think is unattainable, but you're using all the same equipment, 100% it's attainable. It's just the way you're approaching it, right? Yeah. And I think a lot of people's problem with negative space is they feel like when they look at it, it's too large of an area of negative space, they feel like it looks unfinished. And they feel like they need to add some kind of subtle gray, some kind of subtle texture, some subtlety to make that space appropriate for everything else, right? Before, before I walked over here, I'm in that area. Are you? Yeah. yeah. Like yeah. on the forehead of a female face. Right. I'm like, man, it looks good by itself with nothing. But my mind is telling me I need to put a little bit like gray in there because I know it's going to heal like really soft. But, I, you know, I, and I go for longevity, so I go for the heal look. But... You know, sometimes it really does look good with nothing there for readability. Right, yeah. right. Listen, my, my answer to that would be is some people think that if there's an area that could have some gray in it, if they put some light gray in it, oh, it shouldn't be that bad because it's light gray, so it's not going to dim it down that much, right? So I could get away with a little bit, right? But losing the vibrancy of your tattoo does not come from which tone you're using. It comes from how much space you leave open or closed. So even if you used your lightest, lightest gray, like a one drop, and you tone over half of your negative space, you are t toning down the tattoo by 70%. Yeah. Not, it's not subtle. It's just because it's light, it doesn't mean that it's going to stay semi-bright. Once that's not skin tone anymore, it's not bright. Just because something's there. Just because something is over it. The only thing that, that you could do to make your tattoo stand out more or be brighter is leave more negative skin. That is the only way. It's not lighter grays. It's not none of that stuff. It's only skin. How do you feel about highlights? White highlights? Mm -hmm. Cause I see a lot of artists. I see a lot of artists. They um, they like to like drown their tattoos in white, and I'd be like, why did you do that? Because yeah. it's gonna heal like kind of scarry in some areas, especially if there's no black up against it. Yeah. So I'm gonna get your take on that. So. You know, I pick and choose which tattoos I use white on. Sometimes the contrast is so good it doesn't need the white and stuff. But I think what a lot of people get wrong is they rely on the white to make their tattoo look clean. You know, a lot of... Trying to hide stuff. They're trying to hide stuff. They're trying to hide holidays. Um, and for those of you that don't know, holidays is basically when there's a gap between the shading and the line. And people call it a holiday because it looks like you took a holiday in that moment. <laughs> and you're just like, man, fuck this. I don't really care about cleaning this up, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but for me... Your edges, even if it's like a light gray edge, a dark gray edge, a black edge, your edges with shading coming off of it has to be crisp as fuck without white, right? Right. And then if you want to decide to add a little white to solidify some edges or maybe in a spot that's wet, like a couple of dots, you can do that. But relying on white for every edge to look clean is where you go wrong because that white is not going to hold that contrast all the way through the healing process. Now, I would say there is a proper way to apply white you can apply lines oh, of weight yeah. with white without scarring without it falling out and all of that stuff and obviously this has to do with skin tone as well on dark skin i would hardly use i'd probably use zero white i I'm, I'm speaking based off of dark skin yeah so on dark skin i would very minimally if anything i would put a dot in the eye for the exactly. thing i swear i'll be preaching this at home bro if you start doing white on dark skin first of all it shows up so bright when you first do it, it won't be that bright when it heals, but I'm saying it shows up so bright when you first do it that you, once you do one line of white, you have to go through the entire tattoo and do white. Cohesive. Otherwise, it's going to look crazy. Like if you do like a chin line and you highlight it, you're going to have to run through the entire tattoo with white for it to look appropriate. Right. And even then, I'm just like, if you're going to have to do that, just don't do it. Just don't do it at all. That's, that's what I'd be saying back at home. Yeah, tell, them, back at home, tell them to rely on their contrast and their edges being completely solid and rely on that, that dark black and then that 
wide open skin. And to your point with the tattoo you're doing now, you have more to do around the face. Don't even fucking touch the face with extra gray right until you get everything else done. Then you can make that decision. But even at that point, I feel like you're going to realize, damn, this actually looks great the way it is. Yeah, just leave it alone. Yeah, and I tell myself all the time, like, hey, if you're, if you're second guessing what you're doing, just leave it open. So and would then, you say on like every piece, are you doing like your darks first or are you doing your lights or does it depend on the piece? It depends on the piece, but if it has some super dark areas, like let's say a face has like some dark areas in the cheek or something, I would just, I would go for that dark and try to hit it first try with the, with the tone that I'm using and saturate it. But there's some faces that have more subtleties than that, right? Like there's light shading, but then the cheek shading is slightly darker. It yeah. is just barely darker. So for those situations, I might even go in with my lightest gray, that, like my three drop. I'll tone over everything that's not supposed to be a highlight first and try to get it as smooth as possible. Mm -hmm. And then after that, if I'd have to double back and then do like a slightly darker cheek shading right under the cheekbone, at least it'll already be blended out right when I apply it because there's already a base tone laid. Right. And I would only do that for those pieces that have like a lot of like subtle shading changes, you know? Because if you try to do that cheek shading, that cheekbone shading first, and it's only slightly darker than your lightest gray, you're going to make it too dark on accident. Yeah, it gets all muddy. Oh, it's going to be muddy. You're going to have a trouble blending it out and all of that stuff. So um, I know some people do it differently, but that's the way I would do it. But for those ones that have intentional dark shading in the cheek or it's like super dark, I would just try to go straight for that dark. Yeah. And then you bust out your grays and... You know, you try to go over the rest. And as long as you're not putting gray in the spots that you have labeled as high, highlights or like skin breaks, you'll be completely fine. You'll right. be fine. A little bit of free game for everybody. That's what I'm saying, man. It's free. Hey, and this is free game. So if you guys want to drop a badge and support, I do this for free and we do it all the time. Live Q&As, they get posted on Instagram. So if you want to support, go ahead and drop a badge. Got a good one. Here we go. All right. Um, what is your take on apprenticeships versus self-taught? And the reason why I ask this is because, uh, like, let's take me and you, for example. We got two different routes. You had an apprenticeship. Do you feel like you needed that apprenticeship? Do you feel like you would have got this on your own? And from my perspective, I'm self-taught, so I kind of wish I had that apprenticeship because right. I would have had that guidance right away. Right. You're just wasting years at the beginning, like, trying to guess work and uh, watch on YouTube. But you can only learn so much until you have somebody in your face, like, right. teaching you something. Yeah. How do yeah. you feel about that? So with my apprenticeship specifically, I'm glad I got an apprenticeship, but I didn't learn anything about actually tattooing in my apprenticeship. So this is what's weird. I, I knew that I needed to get an apprenticeship because that's what I learned from the internet. Yeah. I did start off in my house. I tattooed for a long time in my house before I got my apprenticeship, but it was really hard to find one. It's fucking hard to find one, especially one that's good, like a good yeah, artist yeah. to apprentice you and you have nothing. You have no like tattoos to show them. You have none of that shit. Somebody's charging you crazy. Right. And I, I had to move to Reno, Nevada from Sacramento for me to find an apprenticeship. And the only reason I did that is because I knew Reno had a ton of shops. So I finally got one after months of looking. And it was dope because I'm like, okay, I want to be a tattoo artist. Now I'm working in a shop. So at least I get that type of experience. I was scrubbing tubes. I was setting up and breaking down. I was doing paper towels. I was shaking inks. I was shaving clients. I was prepping clients. All of this stuff, right? None of it involved actually tattooing. So what that taught me is how to work in a shop before I become a professional tattoo artist. Because if you think about it, if you tattoo out of your house and then you get a job at a shop, you're technically supposed to be a professional, but you have no professional experience until that very moment. Right. So how, it's kind of hard to call you a professional, right? So I would say the most learning I got was after I got around artists that I would consider mentors or people that are really fucking good. This is after I've already been tattooing for years. Okay. The most I've learned about tattooing and style and how to do it and stuff like that is getting around people that have established styles and then learning what they know. And I learned more from that than I did than I ever did in my apprenticeship. What was the best advice you ever received? It's hard to narrow it down because advice comes in different facets about like clients and technique and designing and, and you know, there's a bunch of really good advice I've gotten for all of those things, right? Um, it's hard to really pinpoint one thing. I mean, for the designing and technique side, I say a big thing is like solid black shapes, 
I was going to say contrast would probably yeah. be your answer. Yeah, so. so solid black shapes, which I never thought about before that, which means it's not a area of black that you're shading black. It's a shape that you outline black and you fill in black, like as if you were going to outline a triangle and then fill it in black. That in a realism piece looks different than if you were just going to go into that triangle with a mag. Right. It looks totally different. It gives it a more graphic feel. If I had to describe our style in a name, I would call it black and gray, bold surrealism. That's fire. Like bold yeah, surrealism, yeah, okay. right? Because it's bolder. It's a whole new category. It's bright, it's bolder, it has darks, it has uh, skin breaks, but it's not the common blurry black and gray that people think realism is, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, definitely that, um, the skin breaks thing, looking for the skin breaks. And yeah, if you've got like a busy, a really busy uh, reference and you, you don't know how you're gonna tackle it into a tattoo, being able to learn how to simplify that image into different shapes and shades so that you can tattoo it, yeah. that's a huge part because sometimes people will get these weird ass spots in a tattoo and they don't know how to break it down and simplify it. But if you're able to just pick, first of all, pick out the darkest shapes in that thing. Like where's the darkest shapes? It might be like this weird shape like this. Okay, that's black, that's dark, dark gray. And then after that, you wanna pick out your negative space. Like where's all the negative space in this tattoo? There's a negative space, there's a negative space, there's a negative space. Once you have those two things mapped out, you have the bones, the skeleton of the piece already figured out. And everything in between is just gonna be between your couple of grays that you have in between yeah, yeah. black and skin tone. But really like once you put in that dark, those dark shapes and then you have your, uh, you tone over everything that's not a skin break, you're already 90% there. Now you yeah. just gotta decide how to blend it out or how you wanna do this, how you wanna do that. But the bare bones of every design and every piece is the solid black shapes and then the skin tone. When it comes to enclosing those shapes, uh, do you prefer to use like a, a liner or a round shader? Mm -hmm. Or even, you know, some people can line with their mag. I know I line with my mag a lot and it could be a bad habit, but I mean, the piece turns out good still. And I feel like it heals softer yeah. when I do line with a mag. Uh, I feel like a liner is kind of hard on the skin. Uh, so I catch myself using a lot, a lot of round shaders uh, to like clean up those edges, but everybody works different. So right. what's your take on that? So the way I was taught is that like everything gets a gray line and then you come off of that with a different tone. Like, is this a positive edge? Is this a negative edge? All right, boom. How dark is it? Boom. And then you'd go about that throughout the entire piece. And that's how you would get a sharp and clear 4K version of whatever your reference was. The thing about it being softer, I would use that very sparingly. Anytime I would want something to be super soft is if it's behind something that's super sharp so that you can contrast diffused edges and sharp edges. But other than that, I don't, I wouldn't want like the edge of a rose or a face to be soft because I need it to hold its, hold its shape when it heals so that it stands out when it's next to a bunch of other stuff in the sleeve. So it's like if, if I have a rose in the middle of a sleeve and this entire composition of a sleeve is there and the edges of the rose is blurry, it will not hold its layer the same way than if it was, if it was sharp. Because a lot of this composition and a lot of these sleeves look really good because of the layering. Yeah. So this is laying on top of that, is laying on top of that, and then this is going through it. And all of that wouldn't be possible unless you had the proper amount of edges and like this is layering over this, this solid black, leaf is coming out underneath this negative edge rose that has a sharp edge. It wouldn't have the same punch if the edges of that rose was blurry. Yeah, It's a huge deal for healing over time and then it just looking clean no matter who looks at it. Because subjectively, you're always gonna look at that type of piece and think, wow, that's really beautiful. It, it looks great, it pops, right? But I feel like the blurry, like old school realistic way, that's kind of, it's like dying out a little eh, bit. maybe like, yeah, it looks good by itself, but once you put shit around it, you're going to have to touch it up and, and like sharpen up those edges so that it stands apart, you know? Yeah. So when you're getting into busy sleeves that have a lot of elements and it's very dynamic, you're going to need those edges to be clean so that they could all stack on top of each other the right way. And do you see yourself coming into each tattoo with a game plan, but then as you're going through the tattoo, you kind of deviate from it a little bit? Yeah, that definitely can happen, but I would say you always want to have a system on how you tattoo, no matter what the tattoo is. I think early on in people's career when they're doing random pieces, you know, before you establish a system for yourself, this tattoo you might do 
you're like, today I might black line this, and then I guess I'll just uh, <laughs> solid shade it. I, and then yeah. the next day you're like, maybe I'll try to gray line this one, and then I don't know. This would be easier to black line, so I'm just going to black line this today, you know? Yeah. That type of shit. You rather want to get down a system that you do consistently every time, A, so you can learn the system more and more and get better at it, but B, you would have a consistent look across all of your tattoos, no matter the subject matter. There's a reason why you could tell I did a tattoo, whether it's a Jesus or whether it's a fucking a goat or it's a dolphin or it's a fucking a building. You could tell I did it because I have the same system. I'll gray line, do my solid black shapes, do all my grays, and then do highlights, right? right. It sounds super simple, but if you do it in that order, you always have a consistent look. So, of course, you could deviate in the plan a little bit as far as like how you're going to approach uh, what tone you're going to use here. Maybe I'll go darker here so it heals better. But you should always have a consistent system so that you have a consistent look through your pieces. I've got a fun question for you. A fun one. Party. Fun one. Um, Jessa kind of ruined this one. God damn it, Jessa. <laughs> Shout out, Jessa. Shout out to the Vanessa. I was talking with her last night, and I said, uh, you know, between y'all two, who y'all think is better? And then she said, eh, Shine's going to be a gentleman and say her. So I'm going to ask you. Instead of asking who's better, what do you like most about Jess's work? And then what do you think she likes best about your work? That's a good question. She's right. I would say that she was better. So Jessa is probably one of my favorite artists in the world. And that's not even because I'm with her or I'm biased. I just think that she approaches things in a way that I would trust her opinion. Like, any decision she makes, I know it's going to be an aesthetic one. It's going to be a good one. It's not going to completely fail. It's not going to be the wrong decision. If we're collaborating on a piece and I ask her, hey, what do you think we should do here? And she says this, I 100% trust what she's going to say because she's meticulous. If she does a tiny, tiny tattoo on somebody on their, on their face and it's very delicate and it needs to be done perfectly, she'll do it perfectly. If she needs to do an extra, extra large piece on someone's back and needs to do large area of shading and pack it aggressively and make sure it's saturated, she'll do that perfectly. Yeah. If you tell her, hey, do you want to knock out this black shading or do you want me to knock it out? If she ends up knocking it out, it's going to be solid. You don't have to question anything that she's going to do because it will be the correct answer. I feel like I'm like that to a certain degree, but I would say that her technique as far as a application and stuff, she has such a a good finesse with her hands and stuff like that. And you could see it when she's tattooing me. I'm like a little like by feeling, I'm like, if I got to go like this or like this or, or like this, whatever, I'll just fucking change it up on the spot. So it's like, she's more technical. It looks, it looks pretty when she does it. Yeah. You know, when she's doing her hands and like, Oh, that looks good. How you do that like that. I could get the same effect, but it just looks cooler when she does it. Right. Yeah, yeah. I was and, like watching her today and I, I can tell what you're talking about. Yeah, exactly. And it's like, I don't mind the way I tattoo. I just tattoo the way I tattoo. But um, when I watch her tattoo, I'm like, yeah, that makes sense. And if I tell her to do something, she knows exactly what I'm talking about. She's great at designing. I mean, on any other given day, if we don't feel like designing, like if she doesn't feel like designing, I'll help her with her design. There's been times where we design each other's piece just because, you know, maybe I wasn't feeling it, she wasn't feeling it. And it's a real blessing to have that in our lives because not a lot of people have that, you know. Not a lot of people... Some people might have a tattoo artist as their significant other, but maybe they're on different levels. Yeah. Maybe they do different styles. But if there's someone that I could trust their opinion and then she could trust my opinion, you get something that's kind of unstoppable, right? And I think the only reason I would say she's better is because she's a little younger. I taught her everything I knew. At one point, I was better than her. And she was able to soak it up. And I feel like there's a lot more for her to learn. And she's going to... We're both going to learn it together, but she's definitely going to skyrocket. What like a she humble do the answer. Better. That's a humble answer. Yeah. I yeah. mean, it's the truth. So, you know. She'll appreciate that. I'm, I'm sure she would. I'm sure she'll blush and then tell me I'm stupid and say that I'm better. <laughs> but I guess that's the, the, the positive back and forth reinforcement that we would need from each other. What do you think that she likes uh, best about your work? I think she loves, like, I, I, I could come up with designs and elements for designs so quickly like if she's like man i'm so stuck on this spot i can't figure out what to put here it'll take me two seconds to think of five different things that are just the answer right. she's like wow you just got the answer you found it like I, I was racking my brain this whole time trying to figure out what to do here and you just found the the best answer and i think 
I've just conditioned my mind because I've been doing this type of tattooing longer than anybody here that I have so much in my memory bank for different themes and stuff like that, that if there's like an awkward theme and it's hard to come up with subject matters, I'll come up with a whole story behind a design that I have. Like I'll just, it'll just come to mind. Like that creativity of like, if a design just looks crazy, I'm like, look, this, I'll, I'll put a name to the girl's face. Like I'll give her a name. I'll make, I'll, maybe she has a power over nature and then this bird flies on her shoulder. It's like, and I'll just create a story behind the whole piece and she'll be like, how the fuck did yeah. you do that? But it's just the way my brain works, right? Like everybody else says the same thing. For real? <laughs> Damn. I do. I'll just be looking and I'll be like, I would never think to put that there. Right, right. So I'd say that's the, that's the thing that she would like most about my work. Obviously, I apply everything good and I apply just as good and all this stuff. But like I said, if, if it, if it was going to be a standout thing that would stand apart from someone else like Jess or something, it would just be probably that, more designing. Yeah. Yeah. My wife's uh, mom just said endless creativity. Yes. Just gave you a compliment. Well, she thank you. She doesn't even have a lot of tattoos, but she appreciates the artwork. So it, I thought I'd shout her out right now. Yeah, we're shouting her out. And, you know, it is hard to keep that endless creativity, but that's why it's kind of um, it's kind of that nature versus, versus nurture thing, right? A lot of people think you're born with, like, that talent. But I think that everything is learned. Yeah. And some people just have a more open mind to take in information quicker than others. And I'm the type that I could take in information and I could apply it immediately, right? And I've always been like that. So some people think I have a God-given talent. I just say I'm more open-minded than you are. Ah, uh, smart answer. Yeah. It's, it's the way you look at it. Yeah, yeah, 100%. That's why when I bring new artists in here, I look for their mindset, how they think, and then how they're living the rest of their lives outside of work because all of that is going to play into how you see your job and how you approach it and your perspective on life and, like, and if your shit outside of work is better, if you have a good situation and you have a good head on your shoulders, you're more apt to be able to take in information and apply it because you're, you're not cluttered. Your cache is, isn't cluttered with a bunch of shit. You know what I mean? You have to clear your cache and it's just so you have an open mind so that you can apply. Man, this has been great. Yeah, man. I'm trying to scroll through your, uh, your timeline to see if I get any crazy questions. Seeing just a... Older YouTuber videos. Hmm. Thank you, Miss Satchel. Oh, look at my mom. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think a conversation between you and my mom would be really good. Yeah. Um, he was telling me about you. I'm directly, um, speaking directly to you. I think that's amazing. Um, thank you for consuming any of my content, but I think a conversation between me and you would be amazing because I love having intellectual conversations with people that are able to get into that mode where you're just letting it fly and it's a lot of relevant stuff. And you know, a lot of people can't do that, but the people that can, if you get together with two different people that are good at that stuff, there's a lot of stuff that comes out of that that everyone could take value from. She's very motivational. Uh, and the mindset that you have to have on a day-to-day -day basis, she just has it naturally. So for her to like be in my corner, I almost have like no reason to, you know, not push myself to another level, go out and take chances. Like, come out here. I never guessed by it at a place before, so uh, this is a big opportunity for me. And Wait, you never guessed by it? What do you mean? I never guessed by it at a shop before. Really? It's my first one. I just figured since you're at so many conventions that you'd be guest spotting too. I get offered, and I don't know. It's like a vibe. Like, if I, I got to fill you out a little bit. Yeah. And right away when I met you in, uh, in Denver, I was like, oh, yeah, he's cool. I know that shop's going to be a good vibe. So, and then I already knew Devon and Rich and pretty much everybody else in the shop uh, from the, the Golden State Convention. Right. Just seeing them, seeing your booth and everything. Yeah. So, I don't know. Compared to other people, when I meet them, something just don't be clicking. So, I don't, um, I don't like, go for it right away. Right. But, I mean, I'm looking to do other ones, but it's going to be hard to kind of top this one. I mean, it's, <laughs> a, <laughs> it's the ultimate tattoo experience for a reason. So, um, like, you make me feel, like, right at home. Uh, like right away and then everybody here is super cool and it's, it's it's crazy to be around like so many dope artists in the same field so same black and gray and you just kind of like bounce things off of each other right so like Reezy's over there like getting his stencil ready he's like yo Sean what's up with this placement blah 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 right and then you give him you give him input and you don't like kind of brush him off you know you right don't, you don't say like oh man like I'm working leave me alone right like you actually give him game 
you fill my ink cap up one time. I'm like, okay, because I, you know, you, you dilute the the black and the intense. Yep. And like, I didn't know how to do it by myself, but you took the time. And right. I think I'm bugging you, but you're like, nah, man, let's go, let's do it. Yeah, man. I uh, it's funny because I'm so used to being like that that I forget that other shops aren't like that. And then it takes someone to come in from the outside to tell me like, hey, this thing stands out to me. But it's crazy because I'm just so like naturally I'm like that. And I think the reason being is because I've been in unsupportive shops that aren't very supportive of myself and I'm trying to do new stuff and I want to do stuff, but they're almost like holding me back on purpose because they don't want to see new shit happening. Right. They're used right. to what they're used to. So for me, it's like if we were able to be if we were able to criticize each other's work and help each other and then make those changes and then put the egos aside to where like if I tell you to change something, it's not that I'm saying you're not as good of an artist and you should listen to me because I'm better. It's not, it's not that at all. I could take advice from you on something just from a third person perspective because I'm so into it that maybe your third person perspective has a different outlook on it, right? Yeah, yeah. So if everyone has their ears open and is able to be moldable while we're in the shop, Whenever we go out into the world, you could be confident that you've already made adjustments that are going to make you better. Because a lot of people, it's the other way around. They make no adjustments in the shop because they're scared of the ego thing. And then they want to change stuff when they leave. They want to go somewhere else for the knowledge. Yeah. And then they're like, oh, I learned so much. But there was so, there's so much to learn just in-house. And if you're able to open your mind to that, it's like You'll grow right away. we can go so yeah. far with just what we have here. We can continue getting better just because we're pushing ourselves. Even if I just tattooed with Jessa, Jack, and, and a couple other people, as long as we were staying on this like course of like I'm trying to change things and do better, we don't need someone that is up here to teach us how to get up here. We can incrementally between each of us and, and reflecting and criticizing to just get a little bit better every time. And then as the years go on, we will, we will never hit a plateau because if I'm starting to feel burnt out, Jess is killing it or Jack's killing Somebody it. Somebody else step up for you. I'll be like, damn, bro, like, fuck, like, slow down, let me catch up. And then all of a sudden, I'll have to kick back into gear real quick. Otherwise, I'm going to fall behind. Right. And uh, it's healthy competition, too. I like that. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. I like how, um, I don't know, I feel like you're opening up a little bit more as far as, like, getting on the road. I don't see you on the road that much. So when you actually came to the Denver show, I was like, I respect that. Yeah, and I think it was because, well, A, uh, starting the shop on, and then building out this shop took a lot of my attention, right? And then at the same time, like, if every one of our artists was going to go to a convention, it would have to be the right timing. It would have to be right for everyone's schedule. It would have to align because some people in here got kids. They got shit going on. Maybe some people have more money than other people. So it's not always that easy to be like, hey, everyone, we're going to this convention. They're like, it's a lot of money. Yeah, they're like, <laughs> hey, man, this is actually very inconvenient. I want to like buckle down and focus on tattooing right now. And then I want to go to conventions, but I don't want to do six this year. You know, yeah. like some people are in that mindset. So sometimes I'll just go to a convention myself without a booth and just be there so I could talk to people and all of that stuff. It has the same. Um I don't know, influence. Yeah. Like, you, you just be in there showing face to the people that actually haven't met you and might have, a, like, an outside opinion of you. Yeah. Uh, and then when you actually meet, you know, meet you and then you're a good speaker and everything, you know, it just resonates better. Right. And I think the situation with Devon and Rich was different because between the two of them, they conversated and was like, hey, let's go to these conventions. And then it helped that you guys uh, connected, right? Like yeah. that's what sparked them wanting to go do more conventions, right? Because it's like, hey, we have an opportunity. We don't have to bug everyone and tell them to come with us because that's a huge undertaking. Yeah. But if we just go and we go link up with this guy, we can go to these conventions and it wouldn't be as big of a hassle. So they were able to knock out, boom, boom, boom. And it just like, it, it just like flowed like simultaneously. Like we, they, they just showed up and then that was my first time meeting uh, Rich at one point, like actually getting to talk to him. Yeah. And then we had a good time, won a couple of awards. And then he's like, all right, Devon wants to come. Mm -hmm. I'm like, man, bring Devon in. Right. Because, you know, I, I look up to Devon too. And then he comes in. And then now we got a whole table full of awards. Because me, Devon, Rich, and my boy Jordan. Jordan go crazy. Jordan's crazy. And then, you know, like, bring, bring Sean and Valentin. And then now we got a whole table full, like two tables full That went full from zero to 100 real quick. You know, I just want to keep it rolling. And then, like, that idea only, it just sparked two, two months ago. So for it to take off the way it did, I mean, honestly, that group, the Flawless Empire group at these uh, tattoo shows, we already, as a group, probably have over 20 awards. 
over Damn. a span of two Damn. shows. That's fucking fast. Yeah. And but were those two shows, uh, both of them were villain art shows. Both of them were villain yeah. art shows. Uh, obviously, it's a little harder to win at like the Golden State and the Empire. No, but it's, there's still yeah. a lot of a lot of artists at Villain Arts. A lot of really good artists too. Yeah. Like I'm not trying to dumb down Villain Arts, but there is a different level when it comes to like those shows and then the the invite only. Ones. Bro, if you win at Golden State, that's like really something to like. That's a big flex. Oh, that's a big flex, bro, for sure. Especially first place or any place really. But yeah. I'm saying, yeah, for sure. So I um, I think you're gonna get. It. I think you should get it. that back piece that you and Jess are working on. Tying it in with the the front piece, I think you should get one at Golden State. Hopefully, but I'm trying to keep my fucking, you know, I'm not. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's the thing is like you can go and try to get awards, but I don't live my life for the awards because I've seen a lot of people get shitty awards from like a Reno convention and then yeah. be like, I'm an award winning artist. You should put it in book the bio. With me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I've never been that type of person, right? I've always wanted to be recognized for my work, but I think that comes from a much uh, deeper sense than just like. Uh, but to that point, if you get something from Golden State, that's something to be proud of for sure, you know? I will say to piggyback off of that uh, that statement, like I I like the awards, but it will never like make or break me. Yeah. It will never make or break that weekend either. Like, well, I, it's not what makes you a good artist. Yeah. Yeah. If you didn't win a single one of those awards, be it doesn't mean anything, bro. It doesn't mean that you're not a good enough artist. It just so happens that the stars align that day with the type of piece you did, who you did it on, who the judges are, and, like, what they what like they personally. Like. There'd be, like, 70 people in line. Yeah, bro. It's just, like, it's the stars, especially at Golden State, stars have to align. We didn't win an award for the, for the dinosaur piece, even though two of the judges came up to us after and said it was their favorite piece. They literally told <laughs> us, like, hey, this is my favorite piece walking around the entire convention. And then we were like, well, why didn't we win? And he said, hey, you know, it's up to the personal preference of the judges. And some of them might not like, you know, maybe they like fine line, thin, I don't know, just different type of stuff. Yeah. So I'm like, okay, well, there's no way around that. So I'm just going to take it on the chin for what it is. So that's why I never get my hopes above a certain amount. I am excited about how much effort we're putting into pieces to enter in the contest because I don't just enter half-ass shit. Um, so that's kind of fun. And considering me and Jess are doing them together as collaborations, it's kind of like it feels dope to fucking go that hard with a collaboration and do just go crazy and then just put your best foot forward. You right. know? And I bet that feels good because like that's your girl. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's crazy, bro. We talk about it all the time when we go home at night. We're like, dude, I'm so glad I have you. Yeah. And it's like... And let me tell you, mine and her relationship is really good, man. We don't, we don't fight. We don't argue. We don't That's any gonna of that. be one of my questions. I was going to be like, uh, Yeah, ask me that question. <laughs> I was going to be like, you know, after a long day's work, you know, let's say you're doing a collab on that back. Like, do you go home and y'all kind of just, you know, bicker at each other? Like, man, you should have shaded that thing better. You should have lined that thing better. Like, what are you doing? Like, hold your, hold your weight. <laughs> it's the opposite, bro. I'll go home and I'll look at a piece. I'm like, man, I'm not even going to post this. And she's like, are you fucking stupid? Like, <laughs> you're not going to post that piece? That piece was amazing. And right. I was like, no, 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 you don't understand. Because when I look at it, I see this little spot here. And then this thing, I should have did this. And she's like, that, that has no value in the outcome. You, you're literally like, like nitpicking about some shit that has no difference maker, you know. And just, well, well, we'll do that to each other. Because you're your own harshest critic, right? Right. It's better to have someone to reinforce your confidence th that way you could trust your own inner critic better because if you just let the inner critic go wild you're never you're gonna hate everything you do but if you have someone to reaffirm the things that are actually worth changing and the things that are just you being hard on yourself yeah it helps you uh better maneuver when you're trying to get better and like analyze yourself you know so if anything we comfort each other too much like we are very we're each other's comfort zone as far as like everything you know like even if we're like damn, like, I feel bad that we're not going to be able to make it to this thing over here or something and blah, man, I feel bad. And it's like, no, we're chilling. No, right. fuck that. We're chilling. Like, if we're chilling, that's what we're doing. We're chilling. And I'm like, all right, cool. That's fuck love. it. We're chilling yeah, then, yeah. man. Like, during quarantine is the hardest thing, right? And we were kind of a new couple in our early relationship when uh, quarantine. We quarantined the whole quarantine together. We had only been together for a little bit. couple. <laughs> right. But what happens is, you know what happens during COVID? You get anxiety when you're in the house all the day. You get stir crazy. You get cabin fever. and You, you almost feel like you forget how to tattoo. Bro, you just, you just like, you wake up in the morning and maybe you're fine. And then 2 p.m. passes and you're like, what the fuck am I doing? My body wants to go and do something. Like, and it's hard to just sit there. But we would constantly reaffirm with each other. Like we'd randomly be like, hey, you good? 
yeah, just yeah. knowing that the anxiety is there. It's like, hey, you good? It's like, yeah, just like, we're good. I'm like, all right, we're good. We're good. We're good. That was actually my last question. What, that, that was the last question? It, actually, my last question was like a while ago where um, I was asking, like, who's better between you and, uh, you and Jessa? And then it just kind of stemmed into that. But, yeah, you answered that pretty good. Yeah, I think that'll be a good question to be answered for the clips and stuff. And um, you definitely had way better questions than just the random questions I'd be getting sometimes because I think some of these guys just throw out a random question uh, that in the moment they want to know, but it ends up being very basic and not personal and not thought through. But it feels like you've thought about these questions a good amount so that you know that you can get some value out of that shit. I'm not going to lie. I woke up this morning, and I'm on East Coast time, so I'm up at like 4.30 this morning on this time. Right. And I'm just scrolling through your timeline trying to make sure I'm not repeating something. I think I repeated like one or two things that you already spoke like spoke on. I just worded it differently. Yeah. But yeah, I'm just trying to like get the most out of your time, out of my time. Uh, I got a little game out of this too. Yeah. Little tips here and there. Um, and I'm sure other people too, because like other people are on different levels of right. their career. So a little game here and there, you know, goes a long way. And then you're going to drop your, your courses and stuff. Yeah, of course. And you'd be surprised at how many people get a lot of value out of even the smallest question that you ask. And that's another thing, because eventually you're going to get into teaching more people and stuff like that, too, because it's the natural progression for someone that's getting good at something. And you're going to realize how many people, you know, the stuff that you want to give them is so advanced. And then you realize most of the stuff that people need to hear is so basic. Yeah. It's like on a basic level and you're helping so many people. There's more people starting out tattooing or trying to stay motivated tattooing than there are people that are just don't need shit. I think half the time it's just reassurance. Yeah, exactly. Just make sure you're doing the right thing or on the right path. I know yeah. for me, like when I hear something from another artist, um, maybe like a bigger name than me, makes me feel good inside because I'm like, all right, I am on the right path. Even if you already knew it, mm -hmm. it's something you already do, something you already knew, but they just reaffirm it for you so you can confidently move forward with that technique or whatever, you're, whatever it is. Yeah, and it's like, you probably know more than you think you do, but again, like reaffirming that shit really cements it into your subconscious so that you can carry it with you in the long term. Builds that confidence. Yeah. And the confidence, I feel like confidence is like one of the biggest things you need in a tattoo, because uh, it can show, like even with yeah. this line work, you'd be like, oh man, he's a little shaky right there. Right. You're not confident on that line. Yep. Yeah. So confidence is key in life in general, right? And like a lot of people deal with that imposter syndrome where they, where they, uh, they're doing something and they're at a certain level, but they might feel like it's a fluke that they got to that point. Yeah, yeah. Or it's like, what am I doing owning a shop, bro? Who, what am I doing teaching people, bro? Like, who the fuck am I, bro? Like, there's people out there that are killing it. Why would I be the guy to give this information, right? But you got to step back and realize that a lot of people, your voice means a lot. Even if you were saying the same shit that I'm saying, but in your own way to different people, yours have, holds just as much value as mine does. So just because I'm out here teaching people and I'm learning this thing, eventually when you get to that point, yours is going to be just as valuable as whatever I'm doing just because it's coming from you and it's your right. perspective and you're a unique human. So just based on that, everything you're going to do is definitely worth it. That's my reassurance right there. Yeah, there you go, man. Um, I know you got to get back to your tattoo because you got a, lot, uh, a <laughs> decent amount to do. And <laughs> it's going to suck because now you're in a different mode. Oh, but yeah. hopefully you can uh, integrate back into tattooing and finish that thing up. Not even sure where she went, but yeah, let me let me go hop back over there. I appreciate you having me on here. Yeah, for this sure, is part man. of the uh, ultimate tattoo experience. That's right, man. I'm glad you're having a good time in the guest spot. This is only day two, but uh, it's been good having you, bro. Thank you. And my mom said uh, she's very inspired by this. That's awesome. And I want to meet Mama one day. Maybe I'll have to come out there. I've been getting her to the shows. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, she actually went with my sister to um, a show in Flint, Michigan, and my sister won uh, Miss Tattoo City. Uh, oh, wow, that's cool. And we got, like, third place for a uh, female tattoo collection. So, damn. That was my first time winning something. What I a cool there. award. That's like a, I've never heard of that uh, category before. That's dope. Yeah, me either. Yeah, that's tight. And she won, like, $500 off of it, and then she has to queen uh, or crown the next queen next year so i'm gonna go to that show oh that's raw show face and i've never so, heard of that yeah oh that's dope man almost like similar to the ink mac competition yeah. going on right now but that's like on a broader scale so yeah for sure for sure that's like a pay to play ship too yeah 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 yeah, but yeah i appreciate you homie all right Let me slap back over here yeah go, go ahead you get a dip out everybody say bye Adios. <laughs> i know you guys couldn't see him while he was answering asking these questions um but you guys will see them on the clip. 
don't worry about it. We're videoing this. We're just going live so that you guys can experience it live and then you guys could ask your own questions. So this will be a lot easier to intake. I don't know if you guys could hear his questions at all during this whole thing. Hopefully you heard a little murmur of it through the volume or whatever, but when we drop these clips, I feel like we got a lot of really good ones. And it really helped that he sat down to ask those questions because he brought out some questions that I don't think that some of you guys know to answer, which is not your fault. It's just uh, sometimes you want to know some basic shit and sometimes the stuff you need to hear, you don't know you need to hear. So it helps when someone is intentional about their questions so that we can get some real value out of these videos. And that was really fun having him. I tell you what, guys, that was, uh, that was a lot already. I'm going to answer a few more questions, and then we're going to go ahead and wrap this live up. I feel like we got some good shit. Is that good? A few more questions? Okay. All right, let's see what you guys have been talking about, because I have been neglecting the chat. I'm going to scroll up to see if I can get some people that asked it earlier. <clears throat> Thank you guys for the badges. I see you guys dropping badges. Um, at the end of this live, you want to drop some badges and support. We're doing this completely for free, trying to add value to you, so drop a badge. Um, Flow Art dropped the badge and said, thanks for the artists and feedback to artists. You a beast. Yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Um, all right. Let's get a question. Get a question. It's a lot to scroll through, guys. It's a lot to scroll through. You know what? I don't ever use that thing. Let me see. Well, you see what's here. What's weird is I'm going to the questions. Only one of them is here, but there's questions throughout the chat. So I'm like, why is it only showing one? That's the only thing. Oh, shit. That was clumsy of me. Okay, let's see. All right, I got a question that said, what do you think about folks who experience guest spotting but don't get bookings and just make the best out of being in the new shop slash experience? This is actually a good question because I have some people that come and guest spot and they're so worried about the piece that they're gonna do or getting a client. And I tell them, listen, if it's comfortable for you to tattoo your brother and not charge him or tattoo your friend or just do something that you're excited about doing so that you can learn some new techniques and apply them, go ahead and do it. I'm not trying to make money off you. I'm not going to get rich off of your guest spot. I really want you to, if you're going to come in guest spot, get the best experience out of it. You might even come here for a week and tattoo for a day or two, and then the rest of the time you don't have a client. It's okay. I'll, I'll, I'll be here with you. We'll talk. We'll have conversations like I just did with him. And that conversation we just had, he'll get a lot out of it, but he didn't have to have a full week booked of appointments to learn something. So for a lot of people, in my, from my perspective, I'd rather them have a good experience overall. And if it's co more comfortable for you and you can't get a booking or whatever, if you just need to bring a friend or bring a relative and you tattoo them so that I can give you advice and you could apply it immediately, I would rather you go back home knowing you took home a ton of value rather than you just scrambling to knock out some tats as if you were back at home hustling some ink, you know? And it's like, it's like, yeah, dude, like soak up as much as you can, go home and be proud of, so I could be proud of the information you took home and I'll be happy knowing that that's how it went down. Even if I didn't make any money off you, it's, that's not the point for me. The point is come and experience what we have curated, meet me in person, see how it really is, and then you can get a good perspective on how I think and maybe hopefully it'll shape the way you think and your perspective on tattooing in life. All right, let's do a, let's do, let's figure it out. Come on. Two, two new good ones. Let's do two good ones. I've been put up, never keep it up, thanks. Um, never had my work done by you. Do you come out to AZ or do any work? Um, never had any work done by you. Do you come out to AZ to do any work? Uh, m mostly I don't tattoo and travel that much, but people come out to me most of the time. 90% of my clients fly in from somewhere. So if you really want to get some work done, just fly in, man. Arizona's not that far. Um, Duration of travel and exercises, do you recommend to get better? I am learning a packer at six by four feet now. And cross hatch mag at 45 degrees. Um, okay. 
I'm trying to really perfect my saturation of tribal. What exercises do you recommend to get better? I am running a packer at 4.5 to 6.5 and using oval cross hatching mag at 45 degrees. How long saturation? Okay. His question was long, too long for the chat thing, but I get what he's saying. The 45 degree angle is a must. You need to make sure your angle of your needle is, um, so instead of it being straight on, you need to turn it like this so it fills in all the gaps. You're gonna go in at an angle and you're leaning your tattoo machine. And once you sink in and you finally feel that good saturation feedback, because a lot of saturation is, is feeling feedback from the skin, through the needle, through your arm, and you can feel it in the vibration. Once you're able to feel that it's saturating in that moment, you need to do very even circles or ovals and make sure you're not missing any spot. You know when you were a kid and you were vacuuming your room and you're doing the lines of the vacuum and then maybe you space out this one line too far away from the next one so you have like this strip that is missed? You gotta think about when you're saturating kind of like that. It's so easy to miss a spot or do a circle that's too wide and you miss this little spot right here so that doesn't get saturated. You really got to feel the needle, feel the feedback, and then be intentional about not missing any spot. Each of these needles are making a dot, which is technically a pixel. And for that to be saturated, every spot in between each pixel has to be filled in. So you really got to get your perspective on what saturation means down because it's really going to come from the angle and the feeling and the feedback, right? To your point about your voltage, 4.5 to 6.5 sounds a little low, but I guess if you're trying not to chew up the skin, that's totally fine. But you could just as easily do it at 7.0 or whatever works for you. 4.5 seems a little low voltage for me because it's barely hitting hard enough or going fast enough for it to penetrate consistently. But yeah, just make sure you're doing an even depth, learn your feedback, get that down to muscle memory, keep a good angle and do ovals and circles to get a proper saturation of black. All right, one more and we're done, guys. I am sweating. It is hot, and Ray has to go home. <laughs> uh, all right, let's see, guys. Let's see. One more, one more. Okay, Tit Tax. Tit Tax asked. I have a lot of dead space to fill and can't figure out how to do so or figure out how to make it flow better without making it feel too busy. I'm going to say that again because I don't feel like I said it even enough, good enough. I have a lot of dead space to fill and can't figure out how to do so or figure out how to make it flow better without making it feel too busy. Okay, so, I mean, this comes down to the designing aspects that are all going to be laid out in mine and Jess's design course that we're going to be doing soon. But a lot of this has to do with separation of elements and contrast. So you could have a lot of elements in a piece, but based on the size of it and the contrast of it, what it's compared to what's next to it, it's either going to stand apart or it's going to get lost in the, in the mix, right? If you have a big area of dark that you could put something there in, you want that thing that you put in there to be more negative, right? So it stands out from the darkness. But if it's very saturated over with grays too much, it's just going to look muddy and it's going to get lost in the overall composition. And then if you're going to put something that's negative there, is it too close to something that's negative also so there's too much negative in one spot? So it all has to do with your contrast, your layering, and your separation of elements. And it's just thinking about all of these things so that you don't make it look too busy. Because I do, I do pieces, I do designs that have a lot in them. There's a lot of shit going on. But for some reason, you could tell what's going on, right? It's because of those clean edges. It's because I'm contrasting it correctly with the thing that's next to it. You don't put an all gray rose next to an all gray something else, right? Most of the time, if you do a rose, if you're going to do leaves on it, you do a light rose and you do dark leaves. Or you do a dark rose and you do light leaves. It's the same concept when you're adding more stuff to your design. So you just really got to make sure your contrast with the thing next to it is proper and then just zoom out of the design sometimes. Like if you're designing a sleeve and you're on your iPad, zoom all the way out of it and then see what it looks like when you're looking at it from, you know, across the street, right? If you can't tell what's going on, you need to change the adjustment of like the contrast of one of the elements or make it brighter, make it darker, make the background darker. You've got to be in a constant adjustment mode in that way. And zooming out of your design 
very far is a great way to get a different perspective on it. Because if you're too close up on it, you're going you're gonna to overpack that thing with too many things. You're not going to be able to tell what's going on, and it is going to be a jumbled mess. So yeah, zoom out of it, separation of elements, contrast from each element, and just make it dynamic and keep practicing, guys. And our course will be out soon about designing, and I think that's going to help a lot of people. And with that question, that'll be the last question I answered. Thank you to everyone who asked some questions. I say right before I sign off, if you want to drop a badge and support, we do this for free uh, almost weekly. And I don't have to do this. I'm dropping game every single time you guys ask a question. So if you want to support, just drop a badge. We'll do this again probably next week or in the next two weeks. I got my podcast coming out, The Hero and the Sage. We shot our first episode recently, and it went great, and we got some of the biggest names in the industry coming on, and I'm super excited about that. So, yeah, uh, keep consuming the content. Thank you guys for supporting.